and welcome to this penultimate episode in our Education 4.0 series with friends at JISC, looking at the changing world of education in the fourth industrial era. My name is Sophie Bailey and this week we ask who can help embed new technologies and working practices as we look at the pioneers and settlers needed to create change in education. Recently, it was announced that the House of Commons Education Select Committee would launch a lifelong learning inquiry led by former Apprenticeships and Skills Minister Robert Halfen. This inquiry follows Labour's lifelong learning commission announced in February this year and a major independent commission on lifelong learning launched by the Liberal Democrats last year. A comment posted under a news item on the most recent article about these inquiries read, We need an inquiry into why there are so many inquiries but no action on adult and lifelong learning. We need a reversal of year-on-year budget cuts, some political will and a recognition that learning is not just work-related. This comment got me thinking about the strange alchemy needed to affect change. Take the outlandish and controversial pioneering character Elon Musk and his recently announced Neuralink project, designed to allow humans to control computers with their minds. Behind him sit the R&D scientists in the universities and end users and media who help to generate and disperse the Neuralink concept. Then we have the sceptics and mentors who finesse, mould and shape early stage ideas into something more solid, much like the way wind whittles rock into the stuff that can last millennia. In this episode we speak to some of these characters, the pioneers and settlers who are out there creating change in the education space. First up, Dave Coplin of The Envisioners creates the case for technology as a pioneering force which we should reclaim whoever we are and whatever our specialism. I spent a lot of time in the world of business, I spent a bit of time in the government, and you can see that thanks to a few really important technology, and I'm looking at UAI right now, the world is massively different. And what we need to do is we need to make sure that whatever vocation people choose, whatever career that they want to do, that they have a level of comfort and confidence with technology that will enable them to do that really, really well. So how do we create an environment where they get the right kind of skills? And this isn't technical skills. This isn't about whether they can use Word or PowerPoint or specific coding languages. It's skills like creativity. It's things like empathy. It's things like knowing that given that an algorithm essentially provides you with an ambiguous probability, how do you decide the correct course of human action based on that? And if we can do that, if we can help people build those skills, and then at the same time, and this is the key challenge, I think, for some of your audience, about how do we pivot the way that we provide that service to those people? You know, this is not about universities as they've been for the last couple of hundred years. This is a very different style of education, or colleges too. And it becomes really about how do we create people who are going to be fit for purpose in the world of work they're going to inherit. I love this idea of empowering people to exist in that world of of fast-paced sort of technological change and recently I've been hearing more examples of where perhaps citizens have used AI for their own benefit as opposed to sort of technology happening to them. So one was in the keynote this morning about kind of using artificial intelligence to to kind of scrape data and automatically send off an appeal for like if you've got a parking ticket and then I was listening to a a podcast that Yuval Harari was on on the drive up to Digifest actually and, and he was sort of talking about this idea that you know citizens will be able to start using it to actually monitor governments and in the same way that they're doing to us and so it becomes and and then it becomes less scary doesn't it well I I think so and and what you're picking out there I think Sophie is the fundamental principle about technology for me which is it's sort of a democratizing force it should be for everybody and it should level the playing field that's the point of good technology and the thing that I love about today's world is you know I'm, I'm getting into the last part of my or the latter part of my career and when I started my career as an IT guy nobody else on the planet really cared about technology apart from the, the nerds and geeks like me you've got long hair I'm yeah, going to describe you to the beard. audience yeah yeah exactly <laughs> no, just think of some stereotypical geek and that's me 
And the thing is, we're now in a world where people, they still don't care about technology, but they get how it works. And they get that it can add value to their lives. And every time they have a great experience digitally, and it might be, you know, ordering a coffee from Starbucks before you walk through the door, and as you sail past that queue of 10 people with the smuggest look on your face, <laughs> those are the things that shape people's sort of aspirations for what they want to do. So they have good experiences like that in their personal lives, and then they take that with them. And the next time they engage with somebody, and the next time they have an interaction with a brand or an organization or a service, they have that level of expectation. Now, I would have killed for that years ago when I was building a lot of this infrastructure. We need to celebrate it. We need to understand that people, citizens, students, staff, they all want more from technology. What a great time to be around. Our challenge now is how do we live up to their expectations? And some of that requires a really difficult bit, which is human cultural change. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, I have a sort of a throwaway line at the end of my session, which is really, you know, technology is the, the least important of all of our problems, right? We've got some bigger fish to fry. It's not that it's irrelevant, but unless we get the culture of people mm -hmm. in the right mindset unless we equip people to live up to their aspirations you can forget it and so how do we do that how do how does your listeners in their organizations in their institutions how do they make that happen how do the students make that happen how do the businesses that they will go to work in how do they make that happen i think that becomes the part of the debate that's the rise of the humans part of it is how do we as humans <laughs> live up to the potential of technology that, that's that. basically there for us the rise of the humans because we've we've got we've kind of slumped in the short term <laughs> it feels like yeah, no, absolutely. And I hate it, right? You know, I, we've created this really negative dialogue with technology and we see it in the media, we see it in pop culture. Everywhere you look, it's, you know, a black mirror. Well, hang on a minute. You know, actually, I grew up on a white mirror. I grew up with people inspiring me to want to do mm. amazing things with technology. We need to be doing that. And, you know, not just for our kids, but for everybody in our society. And back to your example about citizens using the power of technology to get a fairer deal or whatever it may be. That's a great opportunity for all of us, as long as we equip people with these basic skills. And so part of this is how do we make sure that everybody, be they faculty staff, be they students, be they just normal members of our society, how do we give them the skills and the confidence to be able to use technology to do that? But what I was increasingly frustrated with is the conversation that I was expected to have with people was about the technology, mm -hmm. which I wasn't that interested in. I want to have a conversation about the outcome. What is it that you want to do? Because once I know what you want to do, then actually we can have a completely different conversation. And, and so we created this position of the chief envisioning officer, tongue in cheek, but it's kind of stuck. And, and now what I do for a living, what my company does for a living is works with all sorts of organizations from very large to very small to try and say, well, what is it that you want to do? And rather than, you know, what we've typically done with technology, which is we've made old ways of working a bit quicker or a bit cheaper because mm. we're using the same old ways of working, but just with 21st century technology to say, actually, the point of the technology is not to do the same stuff quicker and cheaper. It's to do new stuff. It's to do things in different ways. It's to think about, actually, if this is the outcome, maybe there's a different way for us to get there. And so that's really where the whole envisioning piece comes, is it's helping people to see a different future and then to use technology to help them deliver it. And I'm guessing you work in sort of large-scale corporates, but then also universities and colleges. What kind of conversations are you having across these different organisations? What's really interesting is, so I, I work across you know, do a bit of work with government, do a bit of work with large enterprises, corporates, some small, medium businesses, universities and colleges, but also primary and secondary schools. Oh, wow, OK. And what I love, and, and, you know, maybe I'm sort of squishing it a bit, but it's the same bloody conversation. Mm -hmm. It is, how can I inspire you to understand that there's more to the technology? We could actually do more as a result of this amazing technology, and in particular things like AI. And then once I've inspired you, how do we, you know, get the organisation to... Be, be in a place where it can actually make good of it. And that organisation, from that sense, you know, if you're a primary or secondary school, it's how do we teach people to have more confidence in technology and to take the technology out of the computer suite and into the classroom or into the, you know, the tests or experiments that they're running. Uh, at universities and colleges, it's more about a skills piece. So mm -hmm. great that you understand how the technology works. How are you going to apply that? How are you going to apply that to deliver most value to the people that you care about, whether it's a business customer or the end user? And then the same with, you know, organisations, be they government or, you know, some of the larger organisations. It's very much a cultural piece. It's, you know, what's the outcome? How does that make your customer's life any better or your employee's life any better? So really at a high level, it's the same conversation. It's about inspiration and then it's about how do we manipulate the organisation or change the organisation in order to deliver it. Like on a crude level... Is it carrot or stick? So, for example, with people in those organisations, you're always going to have some people like, uh, you know, no better, you know, don't want to change. 
Is it a case of, you know, making that in their, whether it's in their job spec or something that they're measured against? Or how do you bring them along? Or is it sometimes just a case of letting people go? Well, it's all of the above, right? So, so in organisations, I'm all about the carrot, right? I'm all about, let me inspire you first. Mm-hmm. And let me show you what's on, on the table. And, you know, I think of that in really big terms. If you think at a, at a societal level, I think if we could do better with the potential mm-hmm. of AI, uh, we will do amazing things in our world. I think we will help to cure you know, big diseases like cancer, I think we will do a lot in terms of sorting out some of the other big issues that we face as a global society. Um, but also, you know, you take it up to that level, but you bring it down uh, to some organisations and then the stick has to come in. It's like, if you think you can get... Let me just backtrack. One of the things I'm worried about with AI, AI at the moment is automation. So I'll go to a big corporate. Do you know what? I can probably automate mm. arbitrarily 30% of what you do. If you take that 30% saving and you stuff it in your back pocket... The stick comes out because I think you'll be dead in five years because you've lost your ability to innovate. You've lost your ability to deliver Mm -hmm. great customer service. If you take that 30% and you reinvest it into the organization, into skills or into areas where you can add more value than you could before because now you've got more capacity because of what the machines have done, then actually you're going to be great. So you kind of, you need to inspire people, but you also, I think probably more in business. And I actually think with your audience in particular, I think there's a number of people in your audience who are used to a very traditional viewpoint of what education looks like at university and college level. And I'm really worried about that because I don't think that's the world that we're going into. And I think, you know, to those people, what I would say is try and understand the changes and understand the the change of what's happening around what education actually is. In a world where knowledge is no longer a scarce resource but is in fact a commodity that we all share and we all have access to, what is the purpose of your institution? What is the purpose of the service that you offer the people that you look after? Because it ain't about imparting knowledge anymore. It's a completely different game. I grew up on the diet of Star Trek and comic books. Yep. And the thing that I love about Star Trek in particular is Star Trek presented a utopian role of technology in the future to the point where in the next generation in particular, you know how they have different script writers for episodes and they have a set of rules, like Ten Commandments, that if you're going to write a Star Trek okay. script... Rule number three, and I don't know if it was number three, it might be four or five, doesn't matter. Rule number three is basically technology can never be the bad guy, right? Mm -hmm. It can fail, and that failure can cause peril to the protagonist, but in itself, technology is not malicious. It's not out there to get us. And what's important about that to me is it created a generation of people like me and engineers who I now know are at the the top levels in Mm -hmm. companies like Microsoft and Facebook and Google who were inspired to create technology that helps society, What I fear is we've got a generation who are growing up with things like Black Mirror or even just reading the papers about some of the challenges that our society faces with technology. These are not people who are going to wake up and want to do great things. These are people who are going to want to manage and control the technology and turn it off. Mm -hmm. We've got to fix that and we've got to change that. Um, So it is that optimistic view. I look for people, anybody who's looking to do positive things. And, and, you know, as a brand, Star Trek always delivers on that for me. So that's my go-to place Mm -hmm. if I I need to feel happy about it. Um, I'm a really easy guy to find online as well, just search on my name or just on Twitter I'm at D Coplin D-C-O-P-L-I-N Wonderful well thank you very much Dave appreciate your time today That's great thanks for having me Sophie One initiative trying to connect the empowering nature of technology with those operating in education is Step Up a collaboration between JISC and Emerge Education in the UK which aims to deliver a health check and clear and concise information about edtech startups to those in higher ed The Step Up launch was recently attended by the university's minister, Chris Skidmore MP, and a mix of pioneers and settlers across higher education and education technology. I went along to hear from them all. Enjoy the London ambience as we take in ice cream vans and police sirens along the way. Uni2, for instance, they came to us first for our Summer of Student Innovation with an idea they really were. about six years ago. And then and they've been through our startup programme and now they come back. So it's been really good to see them grow through that process from an idea now to a fully formed company that are working with nine institutions. That's our series co-curator, Sue Atwell from JISC. Choosing to partner with a startup feels very risky for institutions so we've developed step up which is a health check for startups so that institutions can more confidently engage with the startups that have passed our step up check they know that some due diligence has been carried out and that the solution is procurement ready this isn't aimed to re- 
place procurement, uh, but more just to ensure that the startup is ready for that procurement process and is also then able to complete the process rather than failing at the first hurdle, which often happens at the moment. All we're really aiming to do is to enable startups to answer the questions that, as an institution, you will ask them if you engage mm -hmm. with them. We're aiming to, with Step Up, give you the answers to questions that if you decide to engage with those startups, your IT department will ask you. Mm -hmm. And we're aiming to bring startups and senior leaders together in a safe non-sales environment so that that collaboration can start to happen. We're assessing pilots at two levels. So we're doing assessed as ready for pilot or staged rollout or assessed as ready for full-scale implementation so that people can be aware of the scalability of those products. So what do education leaders think about this attempt to better bridge all change makers both inside and outside of formal institutions? So I'm here with Chris Cobb, who's the Pro VC and Deputy Chief Executive of the University of London. So welcome, Chris. Hello, thank you. So very quickly before you shoot off into the London evening, we're here at the Step Up Report launch, I suppose. So this idea of providing some kind of health check for universities to better understand what EdTech can offer and kind of how solid some of those organisations are. So I just yeah. wanted to get your kind of your first responses on on that idea. I think it's I think it's very interesting. I think it's very useful. I think generally students are ahead of us with technology. Their expectations are, are outpacing our delivery, our ability to deliver. And institutions are, uh, are going in almost the opposite direction, being risk adverse, being very cost conscious. And, and so uh, Step Up actually takes some of the, uh, the gap uh, away. They make the, uh, the new businesses more accessible, more understanding to institutions, as well as the, uh, the new companies being more available and more sort of identifiable to uh, the institution. So it works in both directions. So it's a good interlocutor. It's interesting to think broadly when considering pioneers and settlers. Anyone who thinks back to their time as a student may recall a wonderful exposure to new ideas and an impulse to action yet to be quashed by other priorities or the trappings of incentives. And there are many great examples of edtech companies launched by students, including Unitu, who I think are great and provide a platform for student voice to be heard and acted upon within the university. <laughs> Standard ghost trick. So I'm here with Andy McGregor, who's the Deputy Chief Innovation Officer at JISC. So welcome, Andy. Hi, thank you. And aside from amazing uh, ghost-related jokes, <laughs> he was also behind... The Summer of Student Innovation. The Summer of Student Innovation. So could you tell our listeners a little bit about that? Sure. So this is something we started way back in 2013, which sounds like ancient history now. Um, we were doing uh, something called co-design. We were asking just members what they thought JISC should be doing with our research and development projects. And someone in the room said, we don't you should be asking us, who are directors of IT librarians, we think you should be asking students. So sure, that's a very good idea. So me and Paul Bailey, we went away and we came up with a competition called the Summer Student Innovation. It, it took a couple of months and we got it out there. It was all very seat of the pants, skin of the teeth stuff and it re worked really well we had 33 applications of students who are coming up with new ideas for ways in which technology could improve education research or student life and they put their ideas we got a few people to evaluate them we had a big event we, we worked with them over the summer and that was a great competition so we did it again the next year but slightly different and over the years we slowly tweaked the competition after a couple of years we realized that we were getting a split of two different types of people entering people who already had a product and are really entrepreneurial kind of proto startups and then students who had a really good idea but no technical know-how wanted to see that idea created so we ended up splitting the competition to, to focus on the student ideas and give them a certain support and then to focus on the startups and over time we learned more and more about startups we learned more about what they needed and we know we started to realize as we talked to more startups and more people working with startups what a huge opportunity there was for universities that was perhaps going unmet mm -hmm. because these 
such amazing innovative startups, such amazing innovative people coming up with ideas from completely new perspectives, but finding it so difficult to get into universities. And over time, we started to realise that problem in more and more depth, and that's led to Step Up, which is essentially an attempt to try and get startups and universities working, make it just a little bit easier for them to work together, uh, make it a little bit easier for universities to procure them, and make it a little bit easier for startups to have the right conversations at the right time with universities. Um, I mean, it's, what's really fascinating about that is I had a conversation with Unitu. Unitu, yeah. And looking at that, so to describe that, it's essentially um, a place where students can put the things that need improving. So whether it's, you know, something's not working anymore or they'd like to see more of. Um, and then these things get progressed in a kind of Trello board style presentation. But what's really fascinating about that, it got me thinking, for edtech entrepreneurs, it's almost like it could become like a lab that generates, you know problem solving real problem solving educational technology based on student need just by looking at that board you could sort of crowdsource some really interesting ideas to go off and, and tackle yeah that's true I don't think the Unity team has talked about that I think like any startups one of the first things we tell them is focus on the yeah, initial problem focus. focus on the initial problems they're focusing very strongly on student voice but I think you're right I think the platform has enormous potential and I think that that matching up between existing problems and people with ideas, people with solutions, is something that needs to be done better. We find it quite difficult to get to students, to get their time, to get them yeah. to come up with the ideas. And we just generally find it best to give them a blank canvas. Recently, we've been, we've been experimenting with a, giving them a specific problem. Like at the moment, we've got a competition out of how to stop cheating for example, trying to get people to suggest yeah. examples for that. But we don't have that many entries. And I think, but we, when we do get entries... Too busy cheating. Too busy cheating, yeah. exactly. <laughs> they couldn't find a way to cheat to give us an entry. <laughs> so we find it better. We get more entries when we leave it completely open. Yeah. But what I'd really like to, I think is really powerful, is exactly what you described. Find a way to create a list of problems in real time and have people try and match make and try and come up with their solutions to problems either existing solutions or completely novel solutions to them because I think a lot of entrepreneurs they love the catch rate to fall in love with the problem rather than the solution mm -hmm. and I think there's a lot to be done more there to curate those problems and spend time on those problems because sometimes startups can appear out of the blue for university and it, it, they find it difficult to match it to a problem they have but I think if we take that problem based approach we might find it easier to get into universities earlier in that startup life cycle. It'd be interesting to know from your perspective whether it, where a university representative sees that an edtech company is led by a former student, whether it endears them to, to them slightly more because you know they have lived through that experience and the ways it might be improved. I think I think that's really true. I think the uh, I think even just seeing the pictures from from earlier today, we had some startups pitching. I think the startups who told a story about when they were at university and the problem they had, I think that just brings it home that much more. Mm. And I think it gives you a sort of authenticity that really uh, rings home with all levels of university, from vice chancellors all the way down to, to, to lecturers and so on. I think that authenticity really helps. It's even better if the, uni the student went to that university. Yeah. See, so many startups start with getting into their own university first and then building from there. So I think it, that is really important to keep that perspective and make sure that that's at the fore of everything you do when you're talking to universities. And I was speaking to a former VC recently and she was sort of saying that half the problem is is that boards aren't, you know, they're not actually competent either because for a lot of these boards of universities, they're not familiar with the solutions or the, or the services or the platforms or the phrases or the that students are using. So when people think about, OK, well, we could use X, it's not what students are using as well. So it's trying to connect the... The two, isn't it? It is, and there's, there's often such different perspectives. One of the things we noticed in the very early days of the summer of student innovation was how many of the solutions students were proposing were peer-to-peer -peer solutions. They saw other students as the vehicle for solving their problems rather than as the university as the vehicle for solving their problems. And I think sometimes that's quite difficult for universities because it involves a certain loss of control over the process. And it involves there's real serious issues in some of that, such as safeguarding and, and GDPR data and so on. But I think if you can find a way to harness that natural desire of students to solve each other's problems and work together I think that's really important but it is a more difficult way to approach things because it, 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 it's just a much more difficult thing to do it's much easier to control things from the centre yeah, yeah, and it's much yeah. more comfortable to do that and anything which involves a degree of discomfort is going to take more time to, <laughs> to adopt as a solution. Any pioneers will also know that family and friends at home play a huge part and also that change is not instant and quite often involves candid conversation before going beyond any transformative event horizon. Hat tip to Mr Steve Wheeler. The, the key problem is that um, startups are risky and universities are risk averse yeah. and we set out to try and solve that. Okay, brilliant. So I'm here with Alexander Iosad. 
Yossid. Yossid. Where's that name from? I'm from Russia originally. Okay, amazing. Yossid. No, tell me how to say it. Well, in Russian tip, Yassad. Yassad. But I've long given up on people here (laughs) trying to do it. I'd like to at least pretend or try. Um, Who's the Projects and Partnerships Lead for Emerge Education. So welcome. Thank you. So, no, we were just talking about, I mean, obviously we've had the launch of Step Up Report and and the kind of framework for that. And you were sort of describing this has been two years in the making. So do you want to give us the backstory to to that coming to life today? So I think part of that backstory is the genesis lies with uh, Mary Kernick Cook and an advisory group that she has chaired for us for the past two years of senior leaders in education and representatives from industry that all came together to try and address the issue of why is it that startups in ed tech struggle to get into universities, despite sometimes fairly obvious benefits, and why is it that universities don't always understand how startups work. And we knew this was the case, we didn't know why it was the case. So we brought together 20 people, senior leaders from um, a dozen universities, people from the startup world, people who've been there and done it, but also up and coming founders, and just had really honest conversations. And that's what we were, we were just discussing is that, you know, over the years you will have dozens of white papers of reports and sometimes it feels like a bit of a deluge and doesn't actually move things forward. But having looked back, I think, you know, each one is a sort of stepping stone to that next version of the discussion and pushing things slightly onwards. Yeah, definitely. And it's important to have that as part of the conversation. You can't just can't leap just into, back. oh, here's the solution. Yeah, this yeah, is, this yeah. is how we're going to do it. Yeah. So, and the group has produced as part of its initial work, a report, a guide for senior leaders in education about how to talk to startups, what are the opportunities, the challenges, how to de-risk it if you want to champion it. That's being published by JISC alongside and this. And you're taking it on the road as well. So going beyond London and going to, you know, whether it's the Midlands or further north towards Scotland as well. Yeah, so we've been through the piloting stage and we know that the world doesn't end in London. And we want to make sure that as many universities can access this program, can learn about it, can meet the startups face to face, which was one of the more successful elements of the event today, and understand that these are founders who are just trying to solve the same problems in in their own way. Uh, So we'll be coming up with more events in the Midlands, in the North, and and make sure this is a a national and, and in the future, hopefully, international initiative. As well as going beyond the city, it's also important to delve into the fringes to affect changes at the edges, the liminal spaces where things happen. That means stepping outside of the CIO office and stepping outside of the degree and stepping outside of the ministerial realm or the existing markets and going beyond the official demarked seats of change to get things moving. Okay, so my role uh, as a CIO, I'm responsible for all of the IT department, but also for the uh, university um, digital transformation overall. So digital strategy, whilst it's a university-owned strategy, is for me to lead and to make sure it's implemented. That's Natalie Tchaikovsky, CIO at the University of South Wales. So activities like today is really important because we can see where some of the things will fit in some of our critical areas of focus at the moment. So employability is um, a big one. The student artship is, is a different one as well, which I really like the product that was being demonstrated today. And actually the one I've never thought of was Bibliotech, which I thought was quite nice and actually make it learning accessible to everyone. And I thought it's really nice. I love the fact that um, JISC and others have procreated, so it makes it a lot easier for us to engage with this company without having the headache of taking them through, are you GDPR compliant, have you thought of X, have you thought of Y? Minimise the risk for us as a sector, which I think is really good. But secondly, I think it's time that we introduce some new suppliers into the sector and disrupt it a little bit. And uh, I always love the idea of moving to whether a massive big ERP system, actually go to modular and, uh, and buy some things that meet the, the needs that you need and then just carry on. And it makes it actually potentially far more efficient in terms of cost. Well, it's really interesting because it's kind of what Ian Dunn was kind of hinting at in, in the panel discussion, this idea of, you know, how do you amalgamate all these? Because a lot of the ed tech 
products are products. They're not necessarily these bigger corporations. So how do you bring them all together? So, so at the University of South Wales, um, we're doing the full digital journey. So we mapped it out all the touch points, understand up um, the products that support all those touch points using the USAIDA capability model as well. Okay. So we started and we write rate it. And we understand if there's compliance, if there's process issue, and then we start to look at it holistically. So in terms of student journey, we can go, well, okay, we've got a few things that are doing the same, or we've got a gap. How do we rationalize? How do we make it better? In terms of learning, we're doing a slightly different approach where we're looking at our ecosystem where it is now, which is very much of a um, still a transactional a way of doing so, so knowledge put, transfer yeah like. yeah it was a nice, I'm not disputing I mean we got some brilliant academic especially in our football academy who really moved on but there are still the majority is still about here's my slide and please go and accept. so we need to move the conversation to what we call engagement which I think Ian actually referred and so we're looking at our landscape and looking okay how much does it currently cost us how engaging is it actually and how do we move forward and we're working very closely with GIST so we're one of the uh, early partners in the GIST analytics so mm-hmm. we've done that and um, learning analytics and the next thing we want to look, move into is that engagement management and so people talk about attendance well actually I want to look at engagement and how does that transfer and then yeah, we can, you can have one person in the classroom but are they actually it, paying attention it, it, exactly. to exactly so uh, we need to move that conversation and then the next thing then after is to start to look in at predictive modeling as well so stuff. one quick final question then so, so working on that engagement piece how are you starting to think about how how do you how do you actually measure that in terms of it is really interesting because actually when it's not just me on my own it's a, it's a collaborative effort and the few people I was like, oh, is it turned up to class? I was like, well, no, actually, you need to start looking and so put it like Ola, Ola or others. You can, you know, you can start seeking, seeing if somebody is actually actively engaging, asking questions, mm-hmm. answering to peers. So you could have the other product like um, the peer review or peer grading, and then yeah. you can see the engagement from that way. Uh, but they are over. So if you start bringing all your digitalization together and start seeing how people are faring then you can start start creating a model for it. Let's not also forget that we are social animals and change can be socially motivated too. Norbert Marowitz is the co-founder of Potentially. Yeah, so Potentially is an employability platform, career readiness platform for universities. Uh, It's a learner-centric platform. We help the students to really get aware of where they currently are with regards to employability and then take them throughout their degree program on a journey throughout those three years in terms of building up their personal and professional skills. And they sort of have a a living professional profile that builds up automatically for them through all of the activities that they do, whether they go to university events or they complete some resources uh, on the platform or things that they do in their own time uh, as well. So it builds up, gives them a sense of progress on a skill level, visually also, in terms of where they're going. And they can share that out to employers uh, or to LinkedIn. And on the flip side for the university, it gives them all the tools to manage that process and really manage this personal and professional development as a learning journey in its own right as well. So typically how it's used to be was if you do your degree program, you come to the end of it and then maybe you go to the career center and they give you some tips with how to fix your CV. Uh, and effectively, you've left it too late and you're just retroactively trying to make up for three years of not having done uh, build up this profile. So we give the university all, all the tools to manage this process and also uh, some reporting to really measure sort of the distance traveled that the student has with them. So they can really see what impact are they making on that student on their personal professional skills journey, how are they developing, how are they growing as a person, uh, even to a degree of like, are they becoming more extra, are they becoming a bit more open-minded, um, yeah, so in, in great detail. That and, gives and your colleague was explaining it to me that, visually speaking, it almost will look like selecting a Spotify playlist. Absolutely, so for yes. for example, if I've realised my gaps, I don't know, are in creativity or collaboration mm-hmm. or communication, and I've built up these resources that are going to help bolster that, and then someone else could tap in and say, oh, like I'm connected with Sophie, 
Yeah. Oh, look at what she's learning. I'm going to learn yes, that as exactly, well. Yes, exactly, yeah. And so it's almost like that idea of a playlist that you mm-hmm. can subscribe to. Or like if you're a cyclist like I am. So I like the yeah. idea of um, stealing people's routes in Strava. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. That's exactly how it... Yeah, so it's, it's, it's this idea of a playlist that uh, works for you and that's sort of not just... The, you along to some degree uh, as well. And it really helps the discovery process mm-hmm. as well and makes it a little bit more social as well as a learning experience. Um, and that matters more and more as, as you go along it might be your own personal development that's for you really but it might feel a little bit uh, lonely in a way because everybody has to figure out for themselves what they have to do next but this makes it also a bit more social and of course with sort of this playlist model more engaging lotus bautista is the co-founder of volo So we are Volo and we have built a career volunteering platform to help students to find skilled volunteering opportunities with local charities. We help them track what they do and then we provide that data back to their universities to help them create more effective and efficient employability programs. And the reason universities might need this is? So the reason universities might need this is that they work really bloody hard to skill up as many students as they can but it's complex it's complex and it's also difficult to do when you have 10,000 students or even when you have 1,000 students so really what the technology does is that it helps them to have a really beautiful management system where they can see everything but also through that management system then contact the right students for the right opportunities um, help them to see cohort-wide what's going on in the institution-wide what's happening as well as look at individuals and see oh Sophie's not done anything oh yeah this is why that's the problem yeah yeah and suddenly there's a cliff and it's employment and- exactly and if I'm correct you also spoke to the minister Chris Skidmore yes we did so how was that he was very very lovely very supportive I didn't have the full conversation with him my co-founder Melissa did because I was talking to another university because they are as important as Chris was I think generally he was great to talk to just to understand from a strategic level what is the government looking at and to recognize that the things that we think that they find important like connecting ed techs and particularly ed tech startups to university universities is important it's on the agenda and that they want to grow that ecosystem so that was good to hear so a smattering of creative destruction to start with some disruption but not too much some patience traveling beyond your own world and keeping the faith with technology and a broader remit of who can tap into it all seem to be answers to the question of who can help embed new technologies and working practices. It's all of us, not on our own, but together. And anyway, as long as we have these guidance processes in place, isn't that far more fun? That's all for this week. If you want to share any of the initiatives you've come across which help pull together change makers, pioneers and settlers in the education space, please do get in touch. If you'd like to leave a message for our next episode, you can go to www.speakpipe.com forward slash the EdTech podcast and leave a 90 second voicemail. You can also continue the conversation online at hashtag edu4 underscore zero at JISC or at podcast EdTech on all the social medias. Thanks also to my guests and you for listening. For all the show notes, it's the edtechpodcast.com. That's all from me. I'm off to investigate the power cut where I am. Have a great week and goodbye.